Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Jesse here. I want to pray, and then we're going to read and discuss Isaiah 53. This is a chapter that is very powerful. It's a chapter in the Bible that describes the suffering servant, that describes the Messiah who's going to come and die and rise again. It was a prophecy in the Old Testament written years before crucifixion was even invented. It was written so long ago, and it speaks of the death of Christ. It's a powerful prophecy. One third of the Bible is prophecy, and this is a prophecy of Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get right into it. Oh, Lord, we take for granted what you've done for us on the cross. Lord, we often are prone to forget and wander from the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. I pray that, Lord, if we are Christians, we'd hear the gospel and be affected by it as if it was the first time we heard it. And if we've never heard the gospel before, I pray people would come to know you, Jesus Christ, through the hearing and the preaching and the teaching of your holy word. I pray you'd use me, keep me humble and dependent on you to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The book of Isaiah, chapter 53, says this. I'm going to read the whole chapter, which is um, 12 verses, and then I'm going to discuss piece by piece each verse. Starting in verse 1. Who has believed what we have heard. And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness. He carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. He was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. We are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man at his death. Although he had done no violence... And he had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a restitution offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. Yet he will see it out of his anguish. And he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many. He will carry their iniquities. Verse 12, final verse. Therefore, I will give him the many, uh, the many as a portion. He will receive the mighty as a spoil. Because he submitted himself to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Thanks be to God. So I'm going to cover, this is a lot of topic to cover, so I encourage you to read this chapter yourself and do some homework. And study this chapter. There's so much theology packed in to this one chapter. So first of all, he describes Christ's upbringing. And then he describes Christ's character and, and what he appeared to be. And then he describes what happened on the cross. And then describes what happened after the cross. So first of all, um, Christ's upbringing. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? Basically, Isaiah is saying, who's going to believe this? 
who has believed this message? Who's really going to take heed to this? He's asking a rhetorical question. And hopefully you would answer that and say, that's me. I want to listen. I want to be one of those who believe. Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 2, here it is. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. So it talks about his upbringing. He grew up like a young plant. That's very interesting how it talks about the young plant. If you go up back to Isaiah chapter 11, that will help understand what he means by a young plant. Isaiah 11 verse 1 says this, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears, but he will judge the poor righteously. And then it describes what Christ is going to do. But verse 1 of Isaiah says that a, a shoot will grow out, a stump from Jesse. Jesse, which is my name, great name, by the way, if you have... If you were going to have a kid, name him Jesse. No, I'm just kidding. But the shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, meaning from the offspring of Jesse, someone's going to grow up. And Jesse was the father of David. And God made a covenant with David that it was going to be through David's seed that the Messiah would come. And it says a branch from its roots will bear fruit. The Messiah is called the branch multiple times in the Old Testament. That when it's the branch or a branch, that is a symbol of Christ. And so Isaiah 11, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 53, um, Isaiah 9, all of these passages in Isaiah are passages that speak about um, the Messiah coming. So he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. You know, Jesus didn't come um, from the best nation in Israel. He came from Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 talks about how Christ is going to come from Bethlehem a little town, a little city. You know, he grew up in Bethlehem. He had to flee to Egypt. Uh, he was born, he grew up and was raised in Nazareth. He grew up like out of dry ground. He didn't come in glory. He came from a dry place. He came from um, desolate places in the wilderness. And, and he, you know, that was John the Baptist, but Jesus also, you know, he grew up in, in a hardship. That's what it's saying. He grew up like a root out of dry ground. He didn't grow up in a comfortable place. He grew up in uncomfortable places. Remember, even when Jesus was going to be born through the Virgin Mary and Joseph, they had to flee where they were living so that they could go and find a place to live. And there was no room at the inn. And so they had to literally have birth Christ in a stable. They had to birth him in an unimpressive barn. And that's what's being described here. Jesus was going to grow up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have, verse 2, Isaiah 53, verse 2, he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. Now, Jesus, when you picture Jesus, when you close your eyes and think of what Jesus looked like, oftentimes we think of him with like perfect hair, a perfect tan, super handsome, perfect white teeth. Um, and we've Americanized what Jesus is supposed to look like. And the Bible says he, he didn't look impressive. He didn't look like a king or a messiah. When you saw him, he was just your average guy. I don't think it means that he was, um, he was like, look, he was ugly looking, but I think according to human standard, he was just, he wasn't anything glamorous is what the text is trying to say which is amazing because God often works in people's lives. He works through humility. He works through people that are not the greatest. That's what 1 Corinthians says. It says, you know, not many of you were of noble esteem when you were called. Not many of you were wise, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise and what is weak to confound the wise. So God chose to have Christ born in weakness, born as a suffering servant. 
Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men. People did not receive Christ. The Israelites, the people who should have received him, mostly rejected him. It was his own people that said, crucify him, crucify him. Right? It was the Pharisees, his own kin, that wanted nothing to do with him. He was despised. He was rejected. Uh, he was, in the book of Luke, right when he started his ministry, they tried to chase him off a cliff. They tried to chase him off a cliff to kill him because they were mad at him. Jesus offended a lot of people. He wasn't, some people loved him, but a lot of people that followed him just followed him because they wanted to keep seeing miracles. They were astonished by the miracles, but they didn't truly believe or love who Jesus was. Verse 3, a man who was a man of suffering, a man of suffering, a man who's acquainted with suffering. When you put the word suffering there next to man, it's saying a man who is of suffering. Not a man who suffered every once in a while, but a man who was living a life of suffering. A man of sorrows is another way of translating it. I like that word, a man of sorrows, because um, it shows that Jesus was sorrowful. He was a sorrowful man. And he knew what sickness was. He knew what it was to live in the flesh in a physical body. Although he never sinned, he knew the effects of the fall. He knew what it was like to be tired, to be hungry, to have aches in his body. He fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. Think about the damage that does to your body. Think about the pain he went through in his body. He experienced the fullness of human life. He knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Verse 4. Now it's going to talk about what Jesus did for us on the cross. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. So he knew what sickness was. And that is using the same word to say, but he bore our sicknesses. He took upon himself our sicknesses and carried our pains. He carried our, bore our sicknesses, carried our pains. Yet we regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. Christ came to suffer for us on the cross. He came when he lived his life. He took on the suffering of others. He carried people's pains. He healed people. He brought life to the broken. He raised the dead, cleansed the lepers, opened the eyes of the blind, opened the ears of the deaf, and healed those with demons. He carried our sickness and our pains. He set us free by his love and his blood. But we returned and regarded him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. When we saw Jesus on the cross, not we because we weren't there, but when the Jews saw Jesus on the cross, they said that he was cursed. They thought he was, they, they esteemed him stricken. They wanted nothing to do with him. And they disregarded him because the Bible says that cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. So when Jesus hung on the tree, they regarded him struck down by God. They, they thought that God was cursing him, but they missed the big picture. They missed what God was doing. Verse 5 says why he was pierced, why he went to the cross. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, because we sinned against God. God had to be pierced. Now that word pierced is very specific. Think about this. This was written thousands of years before Christ had come. Thousands of years before Christ had come to this earth. And there's a prophecy saying how he was going to die. Piercing. Why he was going to die. For our transgression. Crushed for our iniquities. Punishment was on him. Punishment for our peace was on him. When Christ was punished on the cross, he experienced the wrath of the Father. The weight of our sins was upon him. But that brought us peace. Then it says this, we are healed by his wounds. Christ makes us whole by his blood. Jesus, when he healed people, said, See, you are now whole. You are well. You are shalom, which means whole. You are at peace. Christ came to make us whole. Not necessarily to heal us physically right now, but in heaven we will be physically healed. And God even can heal us and has the power to heal right now by his blood if we cry out. And ask him for it. By his wounds we are healed. I know in my life I can testify. It was by the blood of Jesus that healed my sin-soaked soul. I was running from God. And when I was 17 years old, I'm 22 now, just turned 22. 
um, two days ago. <laughs> so just turned 22. But I remember, man, when I first came in contact with the gospel and it clicked in a special way, I knew in my heart I was healed from my sin. I knew I was healed from these idols in my heart and I was made whole and I, I was set on fire for Jesus Christ. And that's what he wants to do for you. By his wounds, we are healed. It took the cross of Christ. It took the beating, the flogging, being spit on, a crown of thorns placed on his head, mocked and crucified for us to be healed. Verse 6, we all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. The Lord punished Christ for the iniquity of us all. That's what it says. Because of our sin, Christ was punished. We all went astray like sheep. We have turned to our own way. Like a shepherd, Jesus was the good shepherd, but we decided as sheep to run away. We decided to be like the prodigal son, take the inheritance and go. And we found ourselves in the mud and Christ brought us back. We decided to run away from God and God decided to run after us and save us with his amazing, gracious love. Verse 7, he was oppressed and, and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. You see this verse in Matthew, 20, um, Matthew 26, 63, Matthew 27, 12, Luke 23, 9, John 19, 9, Acts 8, 32 through 38. You'll see that Christ, 1 Peter 2, 23, you'll see that it says, in 1 Peter 2.23, when Christ was reviled, he blessed. When Christ was, was shamed, he, he didn't speak. He kept his mouth closed. Christ, it's a prophecy saying that when Christ dies, he's not going to scream out and cry out and say this isn't fair. He, you know what? He shut his mouth and let it happen. He surrendered to God and allowed himself to be bruised and beaten. An act of submission to the Father. He could have easily stopped it. Jesus said, I can call a legion of angels to come down and save me. I can do, if I, you know, he could say a word and everyone would fall down dead. When they came to arrest Jesus, he said, I am. And all the soldiers fell down. He could have just kept saying, I am, and making them fall down. And he would have been, he could have escaped the cross, but he didn't. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter. Like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was like a sheep, the lamb of God, slain, keeping his mouth shut, letting it happen. Verse 8, he was taken away because of oppression and judgment. But who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. It was oppression. It was judgment. It was injustice of the Jews who killed him. It was against the law to put a man to death. But they did it on unjust. It, it was unjust to put it, put someone to death the way that Christ was put to death because he never sinned. And then um, it says, verse 9, They made his grave with the wicked, with a rich man at his death, although he had done no violence and not spoken deceitfully. This speaks of Christ's perfect obedience to the Father. He did not disobey God once. Pilate said when Jesus was before Pilate, I find no guilt in this man. Jesus never sinned, not even one time. The devil tempted him in the wilderness for 40 days and tried to get him to sin, but he did not sin because he showed himself to be the spotless lamb of God. That's why the Pharisees often asked him questions to trouble him and trick him and cause him to stumble in his words to show that he was had a blemish, but Jesus proved himself blameless, answering with the perfect wisdom that God gave him. And Jesus shows us that he was innocent. He was innocent. He was perfect. He never sinned. Never once. Then it says, They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man at his death. He was in the grave of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, literally spoken of. Um, verse 9, Matthew 27, 57 through 60 speaks of it. Um, and other scriptures speak about how they made his grave with the wicked. It's um, prophetic. Okay. Verse 10. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a restitution offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. 
A restitution offering was a sacrifice offered when there was a transgression against the sacred things of the Lord. The sin of God's people was such a transgression. You see, the people sinned against God, but Christ was offered as the sacrifice in their place. The Lord was pleased to crush Jesus. God himself crushed his own son because he became sin. When Jesus died on the cross, it says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God was pleased to crush him. Why would God be pleased to crush his own son? Because in crushing his son, he knew that Christ would raise again and he knew that it would bring about the redemption of all who put their faith in Christ, that it would make me a child of God. God crushed Jesus. The father crushed the son under his own wrath, under the sin of us so that we could become saved and go to heaven and have eternal life. God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever might believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 11, he will see it out of his anguish. He will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Christ justifies us. The righteous servant, he never sinned. He justifies us, right? Justification means just if you had never sinned. When you stand before God, it's a legal term that says you're innocent. God, the Father, the judge, when we stand before him on the day of judgment, he'll say you're justified. You're seen as if you've never sinned because of what Christ has done for you. By grace, you're saved. Verse 12, therefore, I will give him the many as a portion. He will receive the mighty as a spoil. Christ gets a reward. Because he submitted himself to death, Philippians chapter 2 says that Christ submitted himself even unto death and therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thanks be to God. He submitted himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. Jesus died with two criminals. He was counted among the rebels. He died with two criminals that were worthy of death. And Jesus was counted with them. He was on the cross in the middle of those two men. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Jesus interceded for the rebels literally when he cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them. He prayed a prayer of intercession for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Praise be to God. Even Jesus dying on the cross with the rebels was prophetic. Every part of Jesus' death was according to Scripture. It was spoken of long ago, and it was fulfilled in the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that shows us that we can have a reliability in Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's clear as day. And the Jews have this passage in their copy of the Old Testament. Yet, their eyes are not open to see that this is speaking clearly of Jesus Christ. And so if you know someone Jewish, I encourage you, open their eyes or ask God to open their eyes and show them this passage and show them how it lines up and points to Christ. All right. I pray that this blesses you and encourages you. Thanks.